today we're going to take you through what is feminine leadership, how it applies to you, um, and then two cases. Uh, one of SEWA, which is an, a, an organization of two million women at the grassroots, and then Eileen Fisher, which is a high-end fashion uh, company, which is has been trying to change the industry from within. So with that, I want to welcome Cecilia and give her um, the mic so that she can uh, introduce uh, this, this session. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, I am Cecilia Conrad, and I am CEO of Lever for Change. It is really a privilege to join this workshop today because I feel like I'm wearing two hats. Uh, the first is that Lever for Change, as you know, is the, the uh, sponsor for this workshop today and the sponsor of the Bold Solutions Network. And so as a leader of Lever for Change, I really hope that the workshop will give you some new ideas and be an inspiration that will help to deepen and scale the impact of your organization's work. But I also have another hat. Uh, as a leader of Lever for Change, I am joining the workshop to build my own leadership capacity and skills. I am a feminist, and Isabel, I am a feminist economist. <laughs> uh, so I know precisely the kind of context in which you have worked for many years. Uh, I have always, as a feminist, been a bit uncomfortable with the title of leader because we don't frequently associated with the concept of feminism. And so it almost seemed anti-feminist, but it isn't. I recently read something that really helped me to grapple with this and to help me to embrace this title. Uh, there's a, a paper about feminist leadership for social transformation by Sriwatha Bhatiwala, who wrote, leadership is a means, not an end. We build leadership capacity and skills for something to do something or change something, not because leadership is a product or service for consumption. And to me, that captures really what our goals are in terms of feminist leadership. I want to thank you all for the work that you do, and I'm really looking forward to this workshop today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So let's begin. Uh, so basically, to welcome all of you and who is here, this is we have a wonderful group. Um, Lever for Change is holding this group, both in the Bold Solutions Network, but also uh, in, the, in, the, in the new work that's coming on, on equality um, eh, on the gender space. So um, this is a big, warm welcome to all of you. So um, the world today, the world today is like 2020 has been a year that I think we will all remember, and we go from one shock to the other, uh, absorbing it, each, each of these shocks, and it's just uh, extraordinary. From the New York Times headlines, which showed 100,000, now it's 170,000, but then it was 100,000 people and just listed 1,000 to give a sense of the loss that we're going through to the riots and people saying enough is enough, we want to change this system, to um, the, the crisis of economic and health crisis, to the children who are leading us on climate change and have not been silenced and actually have been strengthened, to the amazing movement of youth and women uh, that was happening even before, before COVID happened. Um, so uh, there was a study that just came out for the World Economic Forum that showed that the number of deaths in countries led by women was on average half of the number of deaths on countries led by men. And there were 200 countries in this sample. And so there were only 19 women in the whole world leading right now. So they divided the countries in groups just to show the density of the population. So of course, New Zealand and Ireland are comparable uh, Jacinda Arden is famous for having had very few COVID deaths. Germany, Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson, similar sizes, less than 10,000 deaths, 40,000 deaths in the UK. And in Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh and Pakistan, Imran Khan, you see also a big, a big difference. Uh, these differences are basically because women were much more quick and decisive and also because they were much more proactive and coordinated. 
So this data is, is, is a huge, um, for me, it's a huge aha moment in terms of what it means about women leadership. So I'm going to uh, move to, um, to Antoinette, who heads uh, the Eileen Fisher Foundation, who's going to take us to, through the next couple of, 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 uh, of moments. Antoinette, over to you. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you for that, um, that picture of where we are today and what's needed now. Um, so, and welcome everybody and thank you for joining us and, um, and being together in this exploration. Uh, part of this exploration is, um, is definitely about getting data and exploring our own um, perception of that and how that shows up in our world. And the other part is letting it land in our own being, in our own, um, in our own way of being on the planet. And part of the way that we do that at Eileen Fisher is um, by inviting us into a moment of stillness. a different type of leadership which is distributed which taps into the collective and draws on the wisdom of many in our breakout room it came out how it's important to be decisive but also to tap on all the information that is out there to understand what is the best way to, to move forward to allow the leadership to flow upward uh, which can be very crucial especially right now when COVID is such a moving target that we are trying to understand that we're getting new information every day. And um, the, a different type of leadership that is best at leading in rapidly changing world. So what does masculine leadership look like? Masculine leadership is available to men and to women. That's why I put Margaret Thatcher there because some women are very masculine in the way they lead, especially if they need to establish themselves in a masculine organization. So they adopt the traits of uh, the masculine in order to succeed. Very results driven, goal oriented. Elon Musk for me is the shadow of the masculine when there's too much masculine and, uh, and you can see how his leadership has been very draining to a lot of the people that work under the Tesla company. Um, uh, follows a logical decision-making process, focusing on who is right, rather than what is the right thing to do, and strives for individual achievement and personal excellence. So if you see, we recognize these are traits that we see um, in leadership across the world in a very predominant way today, uh, to an extent that, that has generated um, many crises, including the one that we are in now. What does feminine leadership look like? Um, Justin Trudeau is a very feminine leader. He's comfortable with the feminine. Uh, of course, uh, we, we spoke about the Prime Minister of New Zealand and Oprah Winfrey is a beautiful example of very soulful feminine leadership. Understanding that it's about generating leadership in others. It's about focusing on the long term rather than the short term uses intuition that was very present in the chat and sensing as opposed to a purely rational approach, values cooperation over competition and wants to work in an environment where all the voices are heard and systemic change can happen within their community. So these are very two different types of leadership, the feminine and the masculine are available in men and women. It's available to all of us. It's just that our culture has promoted much more the masculine side and has looked down in many ways to the feminine way of leading. So what is an organizational structure for a masculine leadership? Probably organizations that many of us have worked on where the leadership is viewed as hierarchical, where authority is, impro is imposed from the top to down, talent is demanded, you come in and what, what are you going to give to this organization? And usually it's a pyramid-based structure where there's somebody at the top and then a lot of people at the bottom. The feminine leadership is viewed as interconnected. Authority is modeled and persuaded. We talked in our breakout group about informal leadership, 
uh, very important to sometimes you don't have the authority, but you model how to be, uh, how to be a leader. Talent is nurtured and encouraged, and it's a web-based structure. So if we think about the structures, instead of having this top-down command and control, you're really thinking about an ecosystem that you cultivate, you coordinate, it's like you bring this very good soil, you bring in beautiful seeds, and then you nurture them and let them come out, and you don't know how each flower is going to look, um, but you know that you're making the best possible uh, ecosystem for them to, to be what they have to be. So we need to strike a balance. We are not saying that um, men are bad leaders. Um, we need to have a balance between feminine and masculine. Too much feminine would probably delay decision-making, uh, over-focus on relationship instead of results. Um, too much masculine, they discount opinions, predatory competition at the overall of well-being, and we see a lot of that in the world today. So it's the yin and the yang, it's the feminine and the masculine that need to be in balance. And in the world today, we have too much of the masculine and we need our feminine to step into this very extraordinary moment which is calling for this. So I want to give an example about feminine leadership at the base of the pyramid and then Antoinette is going to follow with an example for, uh, for the, from the fashion industry, Eileen Fisher. Um, SEWA is an organization that is owned by women, for women, and th their values are very feminine in the way that they let things unfold and learn from it. There's no set time frame, a very different sense of time as we discovered working with them. The work will take as long as it takes. And sometimes we work with them and nothing happens. Then we come back and then nothing happens. And then suddenly everything happens because there are 2 million women and it takes a long time to bring all the women along. Uh, it has taken 40 years to reach 2 million women and they really look at the well-being of the group including everyone, even if that means delaying so that no one is left behind. It's an ecosystem, they, this, is, this is Sewa, it's like a banyan tree where each of these branches is one social enterprise or a bank or an insurance company uh, or a Sewa management school. They go to the community, they look for what the community needs, they look at the women, they train them to believe in their voice and their leadership and with the women, they find what are the opportunities to increase the income of the women around and form livelihoods around that opportunity. And the banyan tree has this core, this trunk, which is composed of women who are elected in each of these branches. It's a federation, it's a labor union. They are elected to become part of the executive committee that actually runs SEWA. Uh, it's a labor union. There's, their values are very much Gandhian values about simplicity, speaking the truth, non-violence, love the poor, no unnecessary expenditures, taking care of others, all members are the same, no upper class and no lower class. Uh, one of them went to the bank. Uh, all these women come and they are usually illiterate. Um, they try to uh, get money from the bank, but they couldn't sign. So they went to the founder, Ilabat, and they said, we're so poor, uh, but we are so many, why don't we form our bank? And they formed the Sewa Bank. Uh, these are women uh, who make a living out of the collecting trash. Uh, but the, these two women had daughters who were finishing their master's um, education in Gujarat. And what did they do? They didn't want their daughters to continue the life that they had. So they, they created a stationary cooperative. These are the daughters using from the garbage, recycled paper, uh, selling to, to, to actually, to, even to staples um, uh, to in, in, improve the lives of their daughters. Agriculture workers uh, also uh, very badly paid, but they then invented Rudy, which is a social enterprise that packages uh, bulk products into small products and then the women themselves go to their villages to sell the products um, or construction workers that get together so that they have a library of tools that they can use and also they have collective 
uh, uh, power to uh, make contractors give them fair wages, but also to be paid. Uh, same with textile workers, uh, they have a, a factory called the Trade Facilitation Center where the women um, who have these traditional skills get orders and then under a tree or wherever they are, they do the embroidery and then Sewa Camps collects them and puts them together for exports. Um, so how does this feminine leadership in Sewa help alleviate the poverty? They create the environment for people, teams, and the organization to grow. They bring a more nurturing perspective. They create a generative environment that encourages innovation. Women are constantly coming out with new ideas of what it takes uh, to get out of, of, of poverty. They look for local solutions to local problems. They call it the Gini principle. And they tap into the collective wisdom, which is huge given that there's 2 million women um, the solutions take more time, but they are much more sustainable in the long term. Uh, so, so this is the story of Sewa, which is at the base of the pyramid, illustrating what feminine leadership is about. And the beauty is that uh, we can see this applying from the base of the pyramid to the top of the industry, as Antoinette is going to tell us now as he shares the story of these principles being applied in Eileen Fisher. Over to you, Antoinette. Um, so um, a little bit of the Eileen Fisher story. I've been working with Eileen um, and the foundation for a little over 10 years, um, but she started in the, in the early 1980s um, and she had this concept of um, clothing that would allow her to feel comfortable and confident because she felt, I mean, in the bottom, box, you can see the, um, the kind of prevailing fashion of the time in the 1980s was sort of box suits and, you know, even women coming to work were trying to fit into that, um, that example and that kind of fashion statement. And Eileen um, really kind of went the other direction saying, you know, what's going to allow women to feel com comfortable and confident in who they are and what they have to bring to the table. Um, so the top left is an early ad um, and the middle is an early ad. The right is also um, Eileen in her talking about the company and the bottom right is the company just a few years ago having conversations and you see that, you know, women really meeting in circle um, in a kind of different version of, of um, you know, how we might think of, of business happening. So. Um, it's been an evolution, you know, where Eileen Fisher has been uh, in some ways a traditional company um, in business and in a lot of ways, not just in the clothing, but also in how she's run the business um, has been quite, quite fascinating. Um, and the company is 80 something percent run by women. Um, so there's more to say there. Um, and there are positives and negatives to that. But um, when I first came into the to the company, um, we had these uh, leadership practices where it was about communicating our vision, keep it simple, inspiring creativity, team with people, engage people, communicate openly, tell the truth, nurture growth in others, nurture growth in yourself, and create a joyful atmosphere. And these are not necessarily traditional leader pra leadership practices. Um, so I was tasked with bringing some of these leadership practices to young people in our uh, early stages of our young women's leadership program. And I was kind of like, these are the leadership practices that guide the company? Yes. So, um, so that's been, you know, it's continued to be part of everything um, that she has done. But I thought, who better to hear it from than Eileen herself? So I'll just play the beginning of this video. I have learned over the years that my own state of mind, my own clarity, uh, which I don't always have, is a top priority. Every day I'm asking myself questions. What, what am I trying to do? What matters to me? And um, I think stopping to reflect, to think about that, uh, helps to order my life. My mom said, I remember, she said, oh my God, a clothing business, Eileen, you can't sew. 
And then my dad said, oh, well, you don't know anything about business. And I, I, I think I had to admit that those were both true. <laughs> I think I knew intuitively, though, that it worked as a business. For some reason, I did have the confidence that the idea was valid, as much as I don't think I had a lot of personal confidence at that point, really, yet. But I had confidence that there was this idea coming through me. In the early days, I would sit next to the buyers and look at the line with them, because I wanted to know what it meant to them. and you know, what it would mean to their customers. It wasn't so much about my ego and like, this is my idea. I really wanted to serve people. I really wanted to know, you know, how can I make it right for them? I see a lot of people in the company listening and wanting to understand, wanting to serve. It's about making, helping women feel good. Do we make her feel comfortable at work? Does she feel like she feels professional? Does she feel happy when she goes to an event that she can just forget about her clothes and be herself and feel good about herself? Sometimes I say like the company is just like a big school. And, and, and I feel like that about life too, actually. You know, as imperfect as it is, you can just keep, keep trying to make it better every day, keep, keep growing it. I learned so much from people in the company. It's fantastic. And at the same time, I'm becoming more confident that I don't have all the answers, but I have, I have some wisdom. So just a few things that we may have heard in that is um, just on rebalancing and bringing in components of, of this kind of model of leadership has um, she she mentioned a few things that I think it's important to just highlight um, that she talks about following what matters and um, sensing and feeling a sense of her intuition, um, letting go of ego and being in service, listening and teamwork. Um, we also talk a bit about the gray space, um, employee stock options, so really employee ownership. Um, she talked about it as a big school, um, and there are ways that the employees have um, have experienced that. And then bringing ourselves to work, collaboration, cooperation, and empowering um, others to find their own answers. Um, so a little bit about um, how that actually shows up. It's wonderful that we talk about it, but how does that actually happen in in you know anything that we do? And one thing um, is that over the years, we've become a B Corp and a benefit corporation and really uh, maintained a focus on a quadruple bottom line. Um, so it means that we value the environment, human rights, employee well-being, and financial interests. Um, and Eileen talks often about it really having that quadruple bottom line means putting a stake in the ground around our purpose and practices and truly turning business into a movement. Um, and over time, we have really, um, the company has really worked towards specific goals in those four areas, um, knowing that, you know, of course, the financial aspect allows us to do a lot of that work, but all of the pieces allow us to do all of the work. So it's kind of recognizing the full cost of that. Of course, within that, there's a lot of uncertainty. And um, I think part of what we, I talked a little bit about the gray space. Um, part of what we think about in the gray space is um, it's not just about wearing gray clothing. Um, it's really just being with uncertainty. And then also um, trying to take that, somebody, Celia mentioned um, managing complexity. And I think part of sitting with uncertainty is being with that complexity. Um, and so now um, we, we moved towards Vision 2020 and then we um, hit that in some ways and there's some things that we did really well. So actually I'll go back for a second. Um, in 2020, we were moving towards these environmental, human rights, employee well-being um, goals. And um, there's a 
if anyone's interested in seeing more, learning more about what those goals were and how we did, we started to actually measure how we did on those goals. And it was really about looking at what we measure. Um, so for us, it's really been about a um, kind of blend of the masculine and feminine leadership traits because Isabel mentioned some of the decision making and the timing and that came up in the chat. And when we kind of go into that aspect of how we work, um, so, you know, we work in circle and I'll talk a little bit more about the circular system. We could kind of go down the road of continuing to just revolve in the circle in some ways that's really good. Um, and in some ways, you know, that doesn't allow us to make a quick decision. So um, we've had to bring in these other traits in order to make sure that we can keep moving forward. Um, but in the positive section of circularity, um, we're moving towards circular economy and really thinking about how we work with every aspect of the supply chain and think about the third life. Um, so those garments in the pile here are, um, we started a clothing take back program. We started it in the foundation. Now it lives in the company, um, but it's really calling back gently worn Eileen Fisher clothing, dry cleaning it and reselling it. And for the clothing that we couldn't resell, um, we have tried to figure out how we can turn that into something new, which also made the company have to actually look at the starting point and moving from um, the raw materials and the design process so that we can really um, manufacture in a way that eliminates waste so that we can um, think about how we can shift that. And now Eileen, you know, long-term vision, but she wants to make clothes only out of recycled clothes. So um, that might take a little bit longer, but, um, but having the bold vision is important. Um, and another piece of what we've been doing is really around empowering women and girls. So I mentioned the Young Women's Leadership Program. Um, we've run that for about 10 years and um, have been transitioning that a little bit. Um, but we've continued to do work with women and girls, um, including SEVA, um, which we just heard quite a bit about, but SEVA um, now helps to support our um, supply chain communities in India. Um, and there's a lot of good, interesting components of that that I'm happy to share more at some point. Um, and we've also been running a Women Together program where we have been bringing women together around um, around the world and the, and the United States and having difficult conversations, but also um, really applying an awareness lens to um, how we show up in the world and kind of freeing ourselves going beyond the clothing. Um, and Eileen says, I believe that a powerful collective energy emerges when women connect with other women. So Eileen Fisher is a founder-led organization, but it's 49% owned by the employees. I briefly mentioned an employee stock option plan, but in 2005, the company, Eileen sold the company to the employees um, in part because she was, you know, at this crossroads that many business owners face of do I open it up to the public to be able to have the capital the, the business needs, or do I make some other decision? Um, so that would be, you know, often we see companies going public with an IPO, um, Eileen decided to do an ESOP, which means that the employees have profit sharing at the end of the year and they're part of um, decision making. So there's company meetings um, and open dialogue. It, it opens up for a lot more transparent decision making, um, but Eileen still is the majority shareholder. So she can um, make some of the decisions that are needed, which has been actually really important, especially during the time of COVID, because there are moments where, you know, as much as it's important to have these collaborative decision making spaces to also be able to turn to someone and say, okay, what do we do now? And then have that decision making to be able to move forward. Um, I would say that's probably the masculine, but the feminine is the fact that she makes that completely transparent um, and really opens that process up. Um, so that's really the um, the Eileen Fisher story. Beautiful. What I present on the feminine and the masculine comes from Carl Jung, uh, which is the psychoanalyst who worked on the collective unconscious and talked about life's journey uh, is about integrating this feminine, masculine. It's about owning that power. So it is our lifelong journey 
uh, to do that. And I, I think that you were also speaking to, to that power. Um, it's powerful for us as women, it's powerful for men when they own their femininity. And I think it's powerful for us as a, as a planet today to integrate those two in the leaderships that we see. And so um, beautiful, I think the whole, all the dimension, the LGTB dimension, the owning your power dimension, it's all coming together in a moment that, that we really need this transformation internally and, and externally. Thanks to everybody. And I hope to see you in the next workshop and to continue the work together. This was a really beautiful session. Thanks to everybody. And thanks Cecilia for hosting all of us. Thank you. Thank you.